Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 110 of Percussion Discussion. As usual, I'm going to ask you to please check out all of our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our world famous YouTube channel where you can find all of our conversations, past and present. Uh, please subscribe if you can uh, take a second to do so. Uh, it really helps the cause. Also, if you prefer to listen to your conversations on the go, then the great news is all of our conversations are available in podcast form. And these are free to download from your favorite podcast provider. If you can find a few seconds just to rate and review, this helps other like-minded drummers hopefully find us and like us uh, as much as you do. If you can do that, really appreciate it. Thank you. On to today's guest. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to have this gentleman along for a chat. Um, he's not known for being a drummer. In fact, he, he did play drums in his early days, as he talks about in our conversation. But more importantly, he was known for being um, a personal assistant to one of the greatest, uh, most infamous and famous, uh, innovative drummers of our time, um, the late, great Keith Moon. Uh, he joined The Who in the late 60s uh, as a roadie and then quickly went on to become uh, Keith's personal assistant right the way through until 1978 when Keith sadly passed away. Um, you're in for a roller coaster ride uh, of stories about the great man um, and I have to thank, uh, our mutual friend, Bill Sanders for setting this up. So thank you, Bill, um, as well, uh, as being Keith's, um, personal assistant, he has written some great books as well. The first one, which you really need to check out is from 1980 called full moon. Uh, I've read it and it is just incredible. Uh, I'm sure some of the stories we've mentioned today will be in that as well. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome the fabulous Peter Dougal Butler. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Pleasure. Oh, it's it's great to have you. We've, uh, you know, we we finally got there. I know you've just recently moved, so it's uh, you've you've been you've been a busy man. Certainly have. Yeah, been up and down <laughs> like a yo-yo. Yeah, we've uh, sort of downsized and uh, moved from West London down to uh, the Kent coast. So uh, yeah, we've full of uh, packages in the loft we're going through it slowly redecorating so and it's a little bit smaller property than we had so we brought too much stuff with us <laughs> but there you go so a much slower pace of life down there i'm, I'm guessing oh yeah absolutely yeah Careful. yeah and it's really really nice and quiet nice little village i'm in and uh not just outside Dover, but it's I can get to Deal, uh, Ramsgate, Margate, um, Folkestone, Hyde, all lovely uh, areas. And uh, it's quite gentrified. A lot of people from London moving down here and have done as yeah. well in the past year or so. So it's nice. And uh, just finding uh, where the uh, gigs are locally and what have you. So... Uh, yeah, so it's an adventure. So you, you mentioned that, and, and that's quite interesting. That was going to be one of the things I was going to ask. Are you still a big music fan? Yeah, I, I, we like our live music, me and my partner. So uh, we're sort of, uh, as I said to you uh, earlier on, it's, uh, we've made a, uh, friends with uh, a guy called James, and uh, he runs a place in Deal called The Lighthouse, which has local bands and also... Um, singers from abroad as well you know he pushes them where they got uh, maybe a small record deal so and that gets busy in there so, and so that's good and we find and then there's a place in dover uh as well which is called the booking hall that has some good tribute bands in as well so and other musicians so yeah we're getting to find out uh, a few good places good. so life's good at the moment that's what we like to hear yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent stuff. I mean, you you have um, a remarkable story, don't you? You know, and you must look back and smile at all these incredible experiences that you had. But wh where did it? Just describe to us kind of your early days, if you don't mind, Pete. What you know, you know. Uh, well, how, how I got in, how I got involved with the Who, well, uh, briefly is that I was a young mod. And most of uh, I used to sort of hang around in Uxbridge 
and go down the Blue Moon in Hayes, which are all suburbs of West London, and um, got into the Who, the action, all of the, you know, or obviously got into music uh, via the Beatles. But before that, it was like the shadows and everything. And uh, I was in a, uh, I always used to, where I lived as a youngster, there was an army cadet, a, a cadet uh, place, and they had uh, a band, and I used to love the side drums. So uh, I couldn't join them, so I joined the army cadet band okay. and took up the side drums, you know. <laughs> and um, my sister bought me a drum kit, and I used to play, my cousin used to play guitar, who's a couple of years older than me, but at that time, um, I was into football, playing football, and I was hoping to have a trial for Chelsea with a friend of mine, Barry Lloyd, who ended up at Chelsea. Wow. I didn't get it, uh, unfortunately. And all of that, it all sort of my music playing disappeared. And then the sort of Beatles came out in 62. I remember seeing them on a, a TV show in late 62 with Love Me Doing. Got into that, and then 63, Mersey Beats, The Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, all of that. And then in 64, obviously, uh, The Stones, The Who, Kinks, etc. I got into music and um, became a mod, a very young mod. And I met a chap... Uh, these guys, most of my friends were like three years older than me who had scooters. I'd never had a scooter. And I met a guy called Bob Pridden. And uh, we became mates. Anyway, unbeknown to me, I was working at the airport and I used to go to Burton's on a Friday or a Saturday in Uxbridge Town Centre. And Bob walked into the pub. He said, oh, hello, Pete, blah, blah, blah. Um... What are you doing? I said, oh, I'm working over the airport. What are you doing? He said, oh, I'm roadieing for the who. I went, why am I fantastic? All of that. And he said, by the way, do you want to help us out? We're doing a two-week tour of Scotland. I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind. He said, I said, what's the money? He said, £15 a week. Uh, and so you'll get 30 quid at the end of the, of the two-week tour. I said, fine. I'll take a two-week holiday. And I was only getting five pounds seventeen and six in them days. But that was, so it was good money back. then. So that was good money. Well, yeah. I mean, I was uh, eighteen. It was around about June time of nineteen sixty-seven. So I went there, opened up my eyes with that, and uh, then they asked me to stay, and I stayed obviously until I uh, obviously I rode in for them. We just had an old transit van. 3,500 weight, loaded to the gunnels, up and down many stairs, uh, using six-inch nails to hammer down keys kits so it wouldn't go over, but it did every night, obviously, as <laughs> we all know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was quite an enlightening, <laughs> enlightening scenario. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they asked me, I've worked with John, which I did for a little while, and then they asked me to, because to go and work with Keith, which I did right up until uh, 77. Mm. And um, the reason being is in the early days, socially, I was very close to Keith and John Emerson. Well, I used to go around to Keith's flat that he had in Highgate. John just bought his first house in Ealing. We used to go up to the speakeasy and, you know, people you used to see in there, you used to see John Lennon sitting one table and Paul McCartney and I used to go down the pub with my mates on a weekend and say, oh, what have you been up to? I said, I've been down to speak easy and said, Paul McCartney and John Lennon over there and so and so and so and so and go, yeah, of course they fucking were. <laughs> so it was, I didn't believe you. But I, it was, um, I had a great time. I mean, don't get me wrong, when I was playing, uh, working with Keith, uh, he had his ups and downs. Um, Great guy, funny. Um, but in the early 70s, when he, he started getting in the booze and the drugs, there was something wrong with him. I don't mean mentally, but um, 
I think they call it Asperger's ADHD or something like that. But, uh, and nothing was known about any of that in those days. But uh, I don't know. He's, he hit stardom at a young age. Yeah. And it, every, there was all them sort of people popping pills and the, the marquee and everything. I mean, he used to take handfuls. And then, the, you know, over the years, that's a fetcher. Got and to. drinking brandy and everything, you know. As uh, I'm sure we've all seen people go down that road, or know people who have, and, and it's a sad, sad scenario. Yeah. But anyway, what was your other question? I can't remember. I'm just, I'm just fascinated by what you're saying. It's 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 such <laughs> a, such an incredible. I mean, when well, it, it was. I mean, it was for me at that time that they was doing. Uh, the Who sell out and everything, and uh, that was great to, for me as an eighteen-year-old and, and getting off a nineteen, seeing them in the studio, and then them coming through to uh, Tommy. Uh, let's get to the Tommy thing, and then now I'm not a drummer, I'm, uh, but I love watching musicians. And then when you used to see Pete coming with his little reel-to-reel tape demos. And then you just saw these three musicians, guitar, bass, and drums. When you listen to the tape that was done in his little studio, Pete, and then you see what was done in the studio, and the way Keith just interpreted um, Pete's sort of rough drumming yeah. into this unbelievable way of playing on his kit, I've asked many drummers, how do you um, describe his playing? And no one's really come up with a definite sort of answer, if you like. The only way I can describe it is, is like an orchestra, um, et cetera, because you'll probably be able, as you're a drummer, you'll be able to know better than me. But the, the way it, it doesn't feel fill in anywhere but he, he plays right around the kit you know and and he plays sometimes to john's bass line or pete and they and what was fascinating to me i've seen loads of live, live bands over the years is that the way they played together if that what i would call going to like a free form they would read each other and Keith would just automatically change and and follow whatever, either John's bass or Pete's solo, where Pete would go into one. But they just used to look at each other and go, right, I'm with you. And it was incredible, you know, for a couple of minutes, and then they'd come back into the song. It was, it was incredible, absolutely. I just find it hard to comprehend because obviously there's there's two drummers that, that, that there's lots of drummers, but when, when you talk of the seventies, it's it's Keith Moon and it's John Bonham. It's there's there's not many others in that era that that drummers no. talk about, uh, and and the fact no. that you've been so close to, to 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 one of those for so long is just incredible. Well, it, I mean, the, yeah, I've got a page on Facebook, and it, it normally comes up. Uh, uh, two or three, four times a year, who's the best drummer, John Bonham or Keith Moon, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I think that's, I, I'm sure you would agree that they're totally different. Of course, of course. Both iconic, though. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, Keith Moon and John Entwistle could have been in Led Zeppelin all mm. them years ago. Um, but I'll tell you a little funny story. We, the Who were playing at a place called The Belfry in West Midlands, which is now a luxury golf centre, I yes. believe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think it was about 69, late 69, maybe 70. I know it was one of them periods. And we the Who were playing there. And the dressing room was a big hotel, like a hotel suite. And uh, they had a ballroom in this, the Belfry. And we got there, cut the Peter, we all sort of, Drove individually there, Pete. We all arrived. And there's a four poster bed in the room. And there's this guy squatting on the floor, leaning up against the bed. Didn't say a word to anybody. 
nothing. So we are all there, all the band, with their girlfriends, wives, whatever. And a few of the roadies coming in and out. And someone said, well, who's this guy? He hasn't said a word. Maybe he's not with us. Can you maybe do that? Don't ask him to leave. So I went up to him and I said, excuse me. I said, do you know anybody here? You he went, no, no. I said, look, you can have the latest who's dressing room. We're going to get on stage. And he got up. And we walked out of the room. I said, what's your name? He said, oh, John. I said, John. I said, I can't break it off. He said, oh, yeah, I'm going to try and write as a lead sample. He said, I've done a, a CK. He said, I, he's my hero. Really? Always remember him saying that, yeah. He's my hero. Just, Unbelievable. Just, <laughs> and none of the band recognised him. Didn't know who he was. Did he still get booted out? <laughs> Well, yeah, well, we didn't boot him out. He went in the audience and, and we didn't see him afterwards, I must have been. And, and and was Keith, did Keith feel the same about John as well? Was it was it kind of... Yeah, that, I mean, that, they, uh, they were great. I remember in the late 70s, um, we, the Zeppelin played the Forum for yep. three, three, four nights in LA. Obviously sold out, 20,000 seater. And uh, we got invited to the first show or the second show. So as we got there, they booked us, me and Keith, into a suite in the hotel that they were staying at, the, at the Hilton. I mean, we were living in LA. Why they booked us a suite, I, I can't remember, but they did. But there's some footage where John Bonham's playing um, Moby Dick. See and <laughs> Keith got on stage playing the Timpales. Yeah. And I know the crowd must have known who it was. And there was a, a mighty roar. And in them days, they didn't have mobile phones, but they had their lighters. So the whole, near enough, everybody put their lighters up, clicked their lighters on. And the roar was fantastic. <laughs> and it was, in the end, it was hard to get Keith off. But uh, it was great. And but then there was all the shenanigans afterwards in the hotel room, which is unbelievable. <laughs> Typical like the Who uh, and them unbelievable uh, motor, little monkey motorbikes going down the uh, corridors of the hotel. <laughs> Everything like that. You know, is it is it kind of, people say, is it a blessing or a curse that there was no mobile phones in them days. I think it's probably a good thing that there was no mobile phones. <laughs> oh, well, I, listen, when I was working with Keith, it, I, I'm, I, if I, if there was mobile phones in them days where I was working with Keith, it would have been a curse. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah. sometimes you have to escape. And I don't, I mean that in the nicest possible way. Sure. But uh, it was a god god sending thing that they didn't have, for, for my personal yeah. opinion. But I, I just can't imagine, you know, those two, icons of drumming on stage i mean w was it a pre-planned thing or did keith just wander on or did sort of john give him the nod and say no well, no it wasn't a pre-planned thing no we was backstage on the side and then i th i think richard cole who's the tour manager and also used to work with the was road managing the who early 60s just said look john's doing this solo thing go up on the side get up on the side of the stage. And that's when I think John sort of took coerced him to come on, yeah. come over here sort of thing. And uh, so it was good. It was spontaneous, I suppose, if you want to call it that. But it was, I'd say there is some footage of it and it was uh, it was great for both of them. I think they both sort of, you know, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Just, I, 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 I still find it hard that, you know, you've, you've watched this firsthand and it's it's all there, and it, wow, what 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 an incredible thing! Do you still think of it like that, Peter? Do you still are you still blown away by what you've seen? I know it was it was your job. Well, yeah, but that that's the thing. It was my job, and the thing where we Keith was we became mates. Hmm. I wasn't an employee because I'd known him so long. Yeah. You know, as I say, if I go back to sixty seven. We were socialising, and I said, and they had no money in '67. Uh, um, uh, I can remember in, in when me and Bobby Pridden were driving a transit van. Now Keith and John had a driver where they used to. If we'd done a gig up north and coming down the M1, 
uh, Wiggy, their driver, said, follow me. He said, there's a garage where I, just before I drop off Keith at Holloway, uh, that's open 24 hours a day, but the guy falls asleep. He said, but what we do, we <laughs> turn the engine off, coast down the hill, and then put the handbrake on, fill the, the car up, and then just start it and bugger off because he's still asleep. <laughs> we, <laughs> we done it this one day. They were in their Bentley and we was in our transit. They filled up with petrol. We filled up with diesel. And we just coasted down the hill <laughs> away to laugh. Because I think all we had was about a fiver in, in our pockets. Oh, no. I, we couldn't, I don't think we even were, had enough money uh, to... Uh, have a meal at the Blue Boar, which everybody used to stop at in those days, you know. Oh, just, good, good, uh, good times, good days, you know. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of memories, a lot of stories. So, you know, some people you, you talk to, ask you questions, and their friends just look in awe or just think you're either lying or you just can't be right of what you're, you're telling people. But it's true. I mean, the guy... Is that was unbelievable, mm. you know? Um, well, the, just the shenanigans. I mean, how many people jump in, like me and Keith, jump into a double decker bus and it's got Tower Records on it, advertising the Who's latest album? Yeah, we've had a couple of drinks, not not drunk or anything. He said, Let's have a bit of fun. So I got in the bus and I drove it down Sunset Strip. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever driven so, a bus before? Uh, after that, I, I said to Keith, I don't know how to stop this thing or put it in reverse to get it back. <laughs> but we did eventually. And we were in just in stitches, in tears of laughing. You know, it was another time we played uh, Newcastle. I think it was Newcastle City Hall. We were staying up at one of the nice hotels up there. And we were all playing charades with all the 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 uh, road crew and everything and all the rest of the band and it comes about two o'clock and uh, these two coppers walk in well, peak hats and everything they come to say to this uh, American comedian not he wasn't well known I can't even remember his name but at a club so they take their caps off and their coats and they started so I'll come over and have a drink, blah, 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 to a few of us and some of the band. Anyway, <laughs> me and Keith have found these set of keys. So without them knowing, I mean, it's a bit naughty, really. We got their cats, got the keys, went in the lift, and there's a, a Triumph, uh, whatever it's called, police car outside with police written on it, blue light on top. So we, <laughs> we got in it and started <laughs> driving around Newcastle. Uh, down one way streets the wrong way. <laughs> he said, Well, we better go back. I said, I don't know where, where we are. I said, I think he's down there. We turn right here. He said, Well, don't worry, let's just stop and ask a copper. <laughs> <laughs> Which we didn't, I might add. Anyway, we got it back, the police car, parked it back outside, and uh, they didn't know anything. So we just put the keys back on their hats, and they didn't know anything. They didn't know we'd taken the car. God. But it's just things like that. I mean, it's loads of stuff we used to do. Unbelievable. So life Unreal. was never, never dull? No, no, never dull, no. I mean, uh, no, it wasn't. I mean, when he bought Tara House in Chertsey, uh, just before Who's Next was released, that was a nice place, but uh, that's when I sort of virtually started working for him personally. Hmm. It, it, yeah, sometimes you wonder, oh, <laughs> what's today going to bring, yeah. you know? But there he used to have a TV in his room, and he used to mainly stay in his bedroom, sort of for three, three days, maybe four sometimes. And he would venture out into the kitchen. We'd never sit in the lounge, like it was a sunken lounge with a TV. Mm. But he'd always go into his bedroom. That was his sanctuary. Used to eat in there, blah, blah, blah. And then maybe on the sort of fourth day when he was up and sort of properly dressed, you go, oh, shit, where are we going now? And then we'd <laughs> sort of go uptown and we'd be out for 48 hours 
just either uh, going to see Ringo at uh, Apple offices or Neil Aspen or, and then end up at uh, Speakeasy, the tr Tramps nightclub. He would meet a young lady, spend the night with her at her place and then I'd just get him home, you know, or be up all night and then drive home at five o'clock in the morning. You know, it was strange. I, I, one of the things I, I I don't really write questions, but I, I just put: av Is there such a thing as an average day in the life of Keith Moon? There probably isn't, is there? I'm imagining. No, 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 no not at all. No, though that, that no, the average day of Keith Moon was, as I just said, would be his two or three days of recuperation in yeah. his bedroom, and then his mind would go right. I've had a phone call. Let's let's go party, you know. And uh, he he had no idea of it. I don't think he had any idea of how much money he earned, how what he had in the bank, because he was always overdrawn. For what I remember, uh, I mean, I remember one tour we done over the UK in the mid seventies, and I think he came after all these expenses and etc. I think he came out with something like forty-seven pounds and eighty-five pence. <laughs> <laughs> with the, the Bristol band came out of thousands, you know, unbelievable. Just sheer extravagance, and and I suppose I, I hear lots of things about generosity on his behalf as well. I believe that you know a generous guy. Yeah, I mean the who. I've uh, done a lot for charity, which is not well known, uh, I have to be honest. And also, he got asked to do a fair bit of his time at charity work. And uh, so that's good. And uh, he done local stuff as well uh, in Chertsey. So, uh, yeah, I, I give him credit for that, without a doubt, you know. Uh, he, he had, Keith had a good heart. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, his PR publicity, a lot of people go, well, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with him? But when I, as I first said to you when I first the interview, there was something, and I don't, I don't want to use this lightly, he, he didn't have a mental problem. He had what we would call Asperger's, I don't know what it would be, ADHD, all of those little things, but he wasn't normal. Mm, yeah. Like you and me. Do you, do you, and I'm not being nasty here. No, no, it's no. because the problem is in the sixties they didn't know about that sort of condition. But now they do. They they could they've got names for every single bit of what maybe Keith was like. I mean, I like to get hold of a psychiatrist and say, look, this is what happened with Keith. What would you pigeonhole yeah. under one of those things? It's never been done, mm. and um, you know it's. But he 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 was crazy, but in a nice way. Yeah, you know a lot. As I said, just said a lot of people go, "Well, he's nuts." Yeah, but he's nuts, and there's nuts. If you understand what I mean? Yeah. Um, he was nice nuts. Yeah, yeah. but sometimes he, it, sometimes it would fall over the cliff uh, and. Would be so nice, but uh, that was far and few between. Yeah, really. Oh, and how was it when you moved over to America? Was that was that something you were looking forward to when you knew that was happening? Well, I didn't know it was happening. To be honest with you, uh, he just uh, split up from his wife, and obviously divorce proceedings were imminent. Then he met Annette in Tramps and. Uh, he went over to America with Pete Townsend because uh, Eric Clapson was playing his first shows over there after Pete helped him off of heroin. Mm -hmm. So uh, Keith went over there uh, with Pete and his girlfriend, Annette, and then while I was there, they decided to stay there. So uh, they rented some places. I flew out there. I mean... We lived in houses in Beverly Hills, Bel Air. Unbelievable, uh, uh, unbelievable. I don't know if you if you're young enough to know. Remember the Beverly Hillbillies? Yes, uh, I am. In there. And 
and they had that lovely big mansion in, in Beverly Hills. Well, we lived just down the road from there. Wow. Uh, and, you know, security at the gates when you drive in, it was unbelievable. And uh, then we we had stayed there, well, was there for about on and off for five years, I suppose. And uh, But uh, in the end, uh, when he bought his beach house next door to Steve McQueen, as much as I loved the weather in LA, some of the people were great. Um, Keith sort of, I don't know, he was a magnet to the wrong type of people, like dealers, what drug dealers, this, that, and the other, who were wealthy guys, you know, in their own right. But, uh, you know, they come around the house or you go to a party. I mean, I've never seen nothing like it. So, yeah, it, it was a total eye opener to me. And uh, that's when he was on the slippery slope downwards. Yeah. And that's when I said to Bill, I mean, we had a great next door neighbor, Steve McQueen, the actor. Um, guy called Harold Grinnell next door who made his money out of fashion but then owned, owned Shangri-La Studios which is the Bob Dylan News and the band and everything used to go to Shangri-La Studios but at the end of the day he was getting worse and that's when I rang up Bill Kersey the Who I said Bill I'm out of here get him on I said because I can't keep up with it mm. and I said um He's doing this, he's doing that, and I'll give him, if he's here for another six months, I guarantee you, Bill, he'll be dead, and he needs help. And I said, he's ignoring me. I said, we're having rows now because of the situation that's, that he's got himself in. And I said, sometimes it's okay, but as soon as these people are on him, they're like leeches, and they bring stuff with them. He takes, and I said, it's a downward spiral yeah. for me and Annette. And I said, he needs help. And I said, you've got to get him on, which in the end they did. Yeah. You know, but unfortunately, eight months later, he dies, you know. Was it was it a hard thing to do to say, get, you know, let, let, get me out of here? Or was it, did you have to think a lot about that? Or was it an obvious thing to do, make that call to Bill? I, mean, I, I think it was, I had to do that call out for me out of necessity because I wanted Bill and the rest of the band to know what the situation was. Yeah. You know, um I could have just said, Keith, I've had enough. I'm going I'm off. Mm. You know, and then just go on a flight home. But I was so close to Keith. Uh, I, you know, I miss him now. Yeah. I really do. I mean I was on the phone to Annette over the weekend, and we both ended the near enough to end of the conversation. Said, "Shit, we we don't all miss it, yeah. and we do." But um, to get back to your question, was it difficult? No, it wasn't difficult to make that conversation to Bill because I, I felt that I had to do it. Mm. Not only for my peace of mind, um, it was for him as well and Annette, but mainly for him because he needed help without a shadow of a doubt. You know, I think it was a year before we put him in Cedar Sinai's hospital in the what they call the thespians room. And that came to $67,000. In the 70s? Yes. Wow. In the 70s. Yeah. In the late 70s. About nine months before all this happened. And... Um, that was for, he went in there, uh, took our advice, checked him in for alcohol and drug abuse, mainly alcohol. I never went to see him, and that saw him a couple of times because you weren't allowed to see him that much. They had to get their own head together and sort themselves out. They caught him uh, drinking aftershave in his bathroom. Yeah, that's bad. You know, one time. And another side, his artistic um, compliment was that it made a tray, you know, a tray that you put coffee cups on and sandwiches or whatever, a tray like that. But what he'd done, he'd got a sex magazine with all these women with big boobs, right, cut them out and stuck them on the tray, all loads of them, with all these big boobs. 
hanging out. And he polyurethaned it. And that, he thought, was wonderful because he'd made it. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of sad when yeah. you think about it because it was his little bit of pride and joy that he'd done. And if you sort of see a lot of people, oh, fucking hell, that, you know, well, wanker, but hold on, think about it. While he was in there, he's trying to get himself dry, trying to get his head together. And that was his pride and joy. So give him a bit of credit. Give him a bit of leeway. That's what I say to people, you know. Give him time to breathe. And uh, and he was great. And then we got a phone call. He came out and then about we had to fly back to London to start recording. So I'm in British Airways, right? We're in the VIP lounge. We got three first class tickets in this beautiful lounge. Um, we're having coffee and tea, this, that, and the other. He's not drinking at all. Then um a British Airways girl comes up to me, and said, Oh, we've got someone up the front. And uh who's an English rock star and uh, he's dressed really funny but he's got a stuffed alligator on a lead on wheels and he wants to come into the VIP and oh, no, I went, excuse my friend I went, fuck mate I mean, this is all I need to come into the VIP lounge. so I went out and who was it? Richie Blackmore. Oh, no. Right. With, with his, all his funny goth, if he wasn't, I don't know what it was, all his funny hats on, all dressed in black with his crocodile on a lead, on wheels. And I said to this British Airways girl, for God's sake, don't let him in here. <laughs> and I'd sort of try to explain the situation over Keith. Anyway, thank God they never let him in. Oh. Uh, uh, so, yeah, you had to deal with things like that, you know. I mean, the other thing was when he collapsed the Cow Palace, um, which is quite famous. This is old footage, I don't know if you remember that. And when he uh, collapsed over his kit, well, that, how that happened was when we was in San Francisco, we was. Uh, based in this hotel for a week. So it was our sort of centre flying up and down the West Coast. This beautiful girl came in the foyer as we was waiting for the limos and talking to people. So he's sort of in a foyer for about maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I see him talking to this lovely, attractive girl, lady, probably mid twenty or something like that. Stunning. Anyway, he's invited her to the show. He's never met her before. She gets in the limousine with him, right? We get backstage. It's drinks and all foods put on backstage in the dressing room, and then there's a VIP sort of bit in there as well. So as time goes along, the band goes on stage. And she seems quite normal, talking to everybody, talking to Keith. And then I'm sort of backstage behind uh Keith's drum tech and one sort of walking about backstage, you know, get a uh, not a phone call. Someone runs up to me and says, Oh, we've had this girl's collapsed and kicking up in the air and her arms are flying around. I got to take her to the hospital. So in the gigs like that, they always used to have an ambulance on standby. So she's taking the ambulance, so there's no ambulance, right? So I don't know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour passes. That's when Keith collapses, right? So where's the medical staff? We haven't got any. They were in the ambulance and gone with her, right? So I've had to rush out through the crowd to the foyer to get what they call in them days in America, a free doctor. So you have to ring this number. And they ask for a free doctor, and they put you through to whoever's closer to you. Well, I've got this guy who was um, at home babysitting. He said, wait until I get my wife comes home and I'll be there. Luckily, he lived 20 minutes from Cow Palace, and he arrived, and he was, I, I can't remember what he did, Novocaine, I think he was, he, came, he was injecting stuff 
into his ankles. Oh, right. And then he got back on the stage, started playing, and, co- and then collapsed again, and then we took him back. Um, we didn't take him to hospital. We took him back to the, his hotel suite. And this guy, a doctor, just stayed with him all night, right till the next morning, you know. And uh, free. And, free. and it was free. Free wow. doctor. Wow. Unbelievable. And he said, what I found out from, he made a few inquiries because he knew what's a hospital. Anyway, we never saw the girl again. Obviously, we wouldn't allow near Keith. But it was, she took a monkey tranquilizer, elephant tranquilizer, and gave it to Keith. Keith, Keith thinks it's a bit of speed. Uh, and that's why, you know, if someone gave him a pill, he would go like that and then, then ask questions later. It's obviously you know, taken a lot longer to work on Keith than it had on this girl, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what Keith was like. I mean, if someone gave him something, he'd take it. You know, unbelievable. Wow. That's, that's just It's some story you've got to tell, Pete. It really is. And and, and I have to say, one, one of my favourite stories is, and, and I know it's a, it's a, a series of stories rather than one, and that's the eventful trip to Wales. Was it something to do with a rally or something or other? Oh, the the rally, yeah, yeah, uh, the RAC rally. Yeah, uh, yeah that was quite <laughs> that was quite something. Um, yeah, um, we were staying at a place just outside Landidno, and uh, me and Keith went. I was it's half an hour from me, by the way. <laughs> it's just up the coast. Oh, is it? Yeah. That was a lovely coastline. And um, we were staying in this small, well, it was a hotel, but it was more like a, a rather big B&B. And uh, me and Keith drove down there. And also some guys from Track Records, which is the Who's office, because they sort of sponsored this rally car with the Who on it and everything on it. And uh, it became quite a party at the hotel, really. The guy who owned it was quite an extrovert. And uh, (laughs) there, there was, I'm trying to put this in the nicest possible way I can. There were three or four young ladies there. Uh, let's say not of the night, but uh, uh, rather amorous, shall we say? Okay, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> this guy <laughs> uh, just walked in while me and Keith and a couple of others were, as we say, at it, uh, so to speak. <laughs> and um, and he was he was drunk. This guy <laughs> and. Uh, he said, oh, this is unbelievable. <laughs> he was just like, laying on one of the beds with his head on his, uh, head on his uh, hand like that, just going, oh, carry on, carry on, like in Welsh. <laughs> anyway, we didn't. And then we started talking. He said, ah, oh, you know, I've heard about all you. You wouldn't do this. You wouldn't do that. Anyway, we had a, a, a higher Jaguar, and there was a big set of French doors. And he said, to keep up, I bet you wouldn't drive that through there. I've heard all about that. So he just got the key, started the car up, and went boom, 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 and he just went straight into the French windows, into his lounge, only by about four foot. But he took all the he took the, all the windows out and the doors, and he said, "Dear boy, what you read in the press about me is true." Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> God, the guy was flummoxed. He went, uh, I mean, in the end, he had to pay for it. Not not Keith. But we had to pay for the car. That was the only other downside. Uh, I mean, it was drivable, to be honest with you. It was a few bits of the headlights off, but we drove it back to London. But things like that, um, yeah, that was true. Amazing. That. Just incredible. And do you have do you have a favourite story? Do you have one that is always top of the top of the tree? Well, there's quite a few, actually. Um, one of my favourites is um, a guy called... Blue Rides, no, you've probably heard of a uh, famous uh, record producer. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago of, of, of cancer, bless him. But he done an album called All, uh, All This and World War Two, which was Beatles stuff covered by different artists. And 
there was the launch of it in LA. And uh, he wanted me and Keith to go. And um, so what he was staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So he wanted us to pick him up there uh, to go to the launch party. Now, at the launch party, obviously, because it was called World War, all this in World War II, they had these great big art searchlights that they had from the Second World War, which, you know, which they shut up to the sky to search for German bombers. They were all in place. There was a stage all mic'd up. So what we had organised was that we dress up as Germans in German uniform, and he will hire and and we will meet this guy uh, where they hire out for films at this original German half-track machine, which was huge. It's got all the tires at the front. It's got, uh, like, tank, what's his name, at the back, right? And the thing made a hell of a noise. So Annette goes to this pickup point. She followed us. I'm dressed as a German. Keith's dressed as Rommel, right? And this is all open top. And we're driving down Sunset. you got a picture of this lovely uh, summer's evening going down Sunset, and you have to pull in to the Beverly Hills Hotel, right? So pulls in. Keith, now, obviously, we're both dressed as Germans. I'm just all really German. He's Rommel. Pull in right in the front. Keith said to the driver, give me the keys, dear boy. He both jumped down. He's got to the keys. Now, I don't know if you've been to LA and all these, but they have parking attendants. So Keith has gone up and he's flicked the keys to the parking attendants and gone, Dear boy, park this. <laughs> this fucking great big tank thing. Right, so we go in a reception. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of Jewish people in this hotel, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about anything to do with that. So we walk up to the telephone. There's telephones on the wall where you can ring up to the room, right? So we knew Lou Reisner's room. So we're both standing there, up against the wall, telephone. Hello, Lou, we're downstairs, uh, we're ready. He said, I'm not quite ready, I'll meet you in the polo. So he put the phone down and he went, oh, my God, he said, we've got to walk in there, he's going to meet us in the polo. If Lou is dressed up as an SS officer, <laughs> right? So we walk into the polo lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel, right? And it is full. We walk up to the bar. Keith clicks his heels, as the old Germans used to, does a high Hitler sound and says, I'll have two large snaps, please, and make it snappy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy serves us. Then we come out of there, and Lou Risen's walked towards us, dressed up as this, oh, he's a Gestapo, sorry, not his, a Gestapo officer. And I just went, Jesus Christ. Anyway, we got back into the thing and we get back to uh, to the premiere thing uh, of the launch of, of the album. Yeah, it's Joe Cocker's there on it and somebody else I can't remember. Joe Cocker's out of his tree. Uh, he falls off the stage while he's doing a speech. Keith comes up and does a little speech. I'm next to Keith and, and Lou Rice, and Keith hands me the mic and says, Go on, Duke, say a few words. And I'm going, <laughs> I had to say a few words. I weren't on the album. I don't know what's going on. So I hand the mic to Lou Rice. Now, anyway, cut a long story short. Uh, we end up going on back to uh, Trankus, the Keith's beach house where he lives next door, Steve McQueen. And we get home, and we're just, you know, it, it, Keith's not drunk. Well, we've had a couple of drinks, but we're merry. We're in high spirits and just laughing and crying, and just like any normal guys do. Anyway, we sit and have a coffee, 
and something to eat, a home sandwich or something like that. But obviously, and then I'll go to bed, but he, he, he obviously hasn't gone to bed because he's sort of still high as a kite, if you like. I mean, in a nice, just through the evening. But he's fallen asleep on the beach, right? And there's, there is a tide that comes in. But Steve's younger son, I think it was Chad, saw this figure on the beach and ran to his dad, Steve McQueen, and said, Dad, Dad you're not going to believe this, but there's a dead German been washed up on the beach. <laughs> and it was game. <laughs> anyway, one of, the, one of my oh, stories. Yeah, it, it was great. Good, oh, good. You know what? What incredible memories to cherish, eh? Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of it's in my book that obviously got published a few years ago, but yeah. uh, that that's been republished by Faber and Faber, and you can get it on Amazon under um, Faber Finds called Full, Full Moon. So I'll make anyway, sure all the links are in the description. So if anybody's interested and they should buy it, then then you know. Go and get it, and yeah, no, it's fun, and so oh. it's, it's 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 basically a book. It, it's it doesn't go into the realms of any of these sort of day to day running of the who or the finances or the. It, it's just it like individual stories of what me and him got up to right from the first time I met him, right unfortunately, right until the end. But you know, but and so you know. I'm quite proud of it, and it's done pretty well. So, over the years, do you know what's really nice is the fact that you were with Keith from when he pretty much, you know, didn't have much right the way through to when he, he was uh, oh, well on paper he was a wealthy guy, you know, and he's had all these cars, yeah, and yeah. houses. That's nice that you've been pretty much the whole journey with him. Yeah, no, he was good. I mean, you know, when he, say when I first started, he, he was still in his. First flat uh, above uh, a dentist in Highgate High Street, uh, just a little two bedroom flat, uh, and nothing to write home about. I can assure you, it was uh, uh, sparsely decorated, if you like, want of a better word. Uh, no money. I mean, no. I mean, God, when I was started working with them, I think they was in about seventy grand's worth of debt. Yeah. You know, seventy grand now is a lot of money. You think about how much seventy grand was then. Oh, you know, the average what wage was about 15 quid, 18, 20 quid a week if you was lucky, I suppose. Mm. So 70 grand was a hell of a lot of dough. But what was good for them was Kit and uh, Chris Stamp, their management, because I think, you know, both of them pushed Pete especially to write. And, and that's why I think the band was so good on stage. They worked so much. Uh, doing live stuff because they had to financially but I call which is probably wrong I suppose I called from like when they started till up to Tommy 68 well when they started recording Tommy sort of 60 late 68 I called it the apprentice years because then you see what the writing that uh, Pete done uh, with Tommy and, and done that, and then you you know obviously you got live at Leeds and, and Who's Next, which was supposed to be you know uh, uh, another album, different type of album. It didn't materialise. The songs on that were fantastic. And then you got obviously Quadrophenia, etc. Uh, to me, I think Townsend's a genius. But as I said to you before, I think that the three musicians were geniuses. They never got on. I mean, they. Didn't particularly like Roger. They didn't get on with Roger. Oh, really? But then, no, no, they didn't. And uh, uh, that's and the other thing, they never socialised together, hmm. other than John and Keith in the early days. And uh, I, but I think that sorry, I mean, they had arguments. Don't get me wrong. The band and, and Roger and Pete and Roger and, and a lot of them. But I think that gelled them together. Mm. But when you think of, of the writing that uh, Pete's done um, and s the storylines, I, I, I think is genius. I mean, there's a famous quote that Pete came out. He said, look, three geniuses and a singer. 
<laughs> I just want a pizza close. I mean, well, you know. what to be said for it, you know? Ah, oh, just just incredible. And but it, it was it was just having said that, it, as I said to you before, it's just so for me as a young guy, just seeing how they produced their their songs mm. in the atmosphere of the studio and the way it came together was absolutely incredible mm. you know and the music they've done and when you and i've seen a lot of live bands well not just recently but i mean in those days in the like in the 60s the late 60s right through to the 70s a lot of famous bands and they're good don't get me wrong but with the who as soon as they got on stage it was like a rocket that exploded and it was boom, and it kept on boom, boom, booming, right until the bloody end. And the energy would turn a quarter, turn off hours like playing. I mean, one guy, I think it was in the state, some university guy, said that Keith done more work in two and a quarter hours than a lumberjack does in a week. Wow. I mean, he, Keith was physically exhausted. He was ringing wet and he used to wear right up well probably right up until the sort of 74 or so uh height like cuban hill boots so he could do his bass drums you know and he used to take them off the chelsea boots and he'd take them off and he just used to pour the water out of them and he used to he used to fill up a bucket by about three or four inches it was so much water unbelievable Oh, just, Unbelievable. And and was was Keith obviously it's gonna be drummers majority watching this or listening to it. Um w- was Keith into drums, obviously an incredible drummer. Would he would he practice? Would he would he just get and Keith, play or, or was it Keith never practiced. Really? Keith uh never had a kit at home, mm. never had a, a snare drum in his garage, didn't have one bit of kit ever, not even in his flat. When I first knew Keith, right up until they died, he never had a kit in his house at all. Wow. And what was amazing, as I said before, is, is seeing him in, in, in the studio with a new song played on a real to real tape and then just putting down these tracks on these drums and he would listen. And the way he interpreted it and played this on this Kit of his was incredible, and when they were rehearsing, like they would, like maybe rehearse in the early days at a community hall in Ham, or as time went on, when they made a bit of money, they would get a, an old cinema, and then later they would rehearse in Shepperton Studios because they bought one of the sound stages. But if he hadn't played the drums for ages, he just used to get on that kit, and he would take it like duck to water. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. But I, I can remember a situation where you were talking about this, is we done, um, we spent a bit of time in John Lennon's Lost Weekend where uh, Harry, he was producing Harry Nilsson's album Pussycats. And this particular track, um, it was an old, I can't remember the name right now, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there was three drummers on it, Ringo, Jim Keltner. Oh, right. Jim Keltner, uh, who I've met loads of times, and yeah. obviously Ringo for years. And John Lennon was producing, so they're three there. I think it was called, I weren't Rock Around the Clock. It might have been Rock Around the Clock. I can't remember. One of the old 50s, late 50s. Anyway, three drummers, right? So they all start off. Oh, <laughs> right. But all of <laughs> <laughs> Lennon's keys all around the cymbals as well, right? So Lennon comes on at the end of the concert, uh, and he's Liverpool vice. He says the to, to one of the uh, sound guys said, "Can you take them fucking cymbals off a of keys?" He said, "He's driving me fucking mad." He said, "He's all over the fucking place on them <laughs> cymbals." But they had to take all the cymbals off. But uh, it didn't. They, it was all right, but. Uh, he was totally different to, to Keltner and, and Ringo. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, and they're both 
great drummers, I think. You know, so I think Ringo is underrated as a drummer. What he done with the Beatles, I really do. Totally agree. And Jim Felton, as as you know, is is one of the best as well. But you know, uh, he he was amongst them. He's up there as far as I'm concerned. And I I don't honestly see any other drumming drummer. Re- Placing Keith. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know. You as a drummer, you would you would know better than me. But uh, you know, there's drummers and there's drummers and there's drummers. I guess, yeah. and it all depends what we're playing. I mean, you know, this brings me to my next, uh, my well, my last question, if you like, and 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 you don't have to answer it. Um, did, were you were you surprised after after Keith passed away? Were you surprised that the Who carried on? Obviously, with, with with Kenny Jones, were you were you surprised at all by that? Because he was such a huge part of that band, you know. I, I well to answer that correctly for for me personally, uh, I'm a bit fifty fifty. I was surprised, um, but then I wasn't surprised, and I think I think in all hearts, hearts, I think Keith would have. Uh, I liked it to have carried on, yeah, um, and possibly with Kenny because um, he knew Kenny quite well. Not that they didn't meet a lot at all, you know, but there was a, a huge affection for him. I know that, um, and I, I, I th- me personally, I think the Who should have packed it in after John Entwistle passed away. Yeah, but then who am I to say that? I mean, now that touring around with an orchestra yes. which i've seen which is nice um but to me they're not the the three three guys or the four guys on the stage anymore it's yeah. it's gone to a new level which i totally understand and get and there'll be thousands of people who want to go and see them which i totally respect um i'll be one of them uh, i won't say i'm not going to go and see them um and it's great i suppose it's great that they're they're still playing. Yeah. You know, they got Zach Starkey playing, who to me is is Keith Moore. He's the closest. I mean, I yeah, uh, definitely. Well, when his dad bought John Lennon's house off in Titnurse Park, uh, Keith gave him his kit, one of his kits for a Christmas birthday present, and we used to spend a lot of time around there when Keith did the church seat at Ringo's, and I saw Zach growing up. In actual fact, in early 80s, I was sort of managing his band for him a little bit just to keep him under control, not control, but just guide him a bit. Yeah. And they used to use um, uh, this gatehouse in Titmurse Park for rehearsals. Well, when I say gatehouse, it was bigger than mine and your house put together. It was massive, right? I mean, the lounge was like a little sort of studio anyway. And... Uh, he used to rehearse in there, but when I used to go over there, he used to have Keith's kit set up, as Keith would have it, and he would have, through the PA system, he'd either have Who's Next on, Quadrophenia or Tommy, full blast. And I used to watch him, because it was on loud, and I used to go in there, and I used to go like that, and he'd be playing, and he had it off to a T. Yeah, yeah. Kid you not, to a T. And he started up a little band called Mono Pacific. They were good, um, but he was only young, 17. And, um, yeah, now look at him. Um, he, he won't play with Roger Solo, so he'll only play with, with The Who. Um, he's a, a very accomplished musician. He's got a lovely studio at Henley um, that he built up of, of an old property. There was a lovely, massive greenhouse on the side of this house. I mean, it was it was collapsed, but it had it all rebuilt. The greenhouse, and he put a studio in there. It's fantastic, and he's now bought. Um, I can't remember the record label off the top of my head, but he, he goes out to Jamaica a lot, and he's bought this record company out there that goes back years because they all got ripped off uh royalties so he's redone them remixed them re-released them so the artists get their royalty so he's good there and he plays a nice guitar as well so he's an all-round guy and he's a very very nice chap as well yeah so doesn't that make a difference 
Eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Goes. Well, I, I tell you what, Pete, this has been, a, 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 it's, I don't know how long, we've been talking for an hour and it feels like about 10 <laughs> minutes. It really does feel like <laughs> So uh, before we go, I have to thank our mutual pal Bill Sanders for uh, for putting us in touch. Oh, thank good you, old Bill. Bill. I, hope the, uh... still ta- I hope you're still taking the pills. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll ask him when I see him. <laughs> but I only I only saw him in January, so um, I put a drum clinic on, and Bill Bill came up and uh, had his amazing practice pads on display. So thank you, Bill. I uh, appreciate it. A oh, pic- it's good to him. Oh, he is. He's 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 great, and he kindly put us in touch, John. And, and I'm very grateful. And, and I'm very grateful for your time as well. No oh, pleasure, absolute pleasure, Matty. Uh, you know, any time, any anywhere, just give us a call. And if you want anything more, by all means, give us a bell, and we'll do something. You know, thank you. Help you out, vice versa. Well, no problem. You're, you're a gentleman, and it's appreciated. No, thank you for having us. That's great. Cheers, Pete. Take care, mate. See you soon. Take care. Long live rock and roll, eh? Oh, yeah. Bye.